Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, is a panel discussing the understanding trends in the unmanned technologies and how it will impact our future warfare. This session is uh, sponsored by Textron uh, Systems and will be moderated by Daniel Lucy, an editor of AUVSI. So, welcome to the floor. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Danielle Lucy. Like I said, I'm editor of the Department of Communications and Publications at the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. Um, like Frank alluded to, unmanned systems are not a new thing. The association's actually been around for 44 years. We have more than 7,000 individual members, more than 600 corporate members, and we represent more than 60 countries around the world. Um, Today, I think we're just going to go down the line. I'll introduce each of the speakers before they speak, and then we'll have a question and answer session afterward. Um, we're going to start with Mr. Bill Irby. He is a senior vice president and general manager of Textron Systems, Unmanned Systems. He leads the experienced teams responsible for designing and delivering and manufacturing and supporting unmanned systems, command and control systems, remote products, and related technologies. So with that, I will hand it over to Bill. Thank you very much. Bill, can you tell us a little bit about um, the emerging marketplace, is unmanned systems, innovation, only about aircraft, what other factors play a role? Okay, that's era? a great question. No, uh, unmanned systems innovation is not just about aircraft, but, but let's start there. There are a lot of things going on in the unmanned systems community, particularly in the area of aircraft, like Frank Pace uh, mentioned. Lots of uh, dynamic movement in terms of uh, system developments in order to operate in uh, controlled airspace. Um, so they can fly in areas that are not strictly for military purposes. Certainly um, communications advancements and satellite communications, as Frank mentioned, as well as line of sight communications, developments in the area of encryption and network capability, etc. But it's not just about the aircraft. If you think about everything that it takes to, um, to operate an unmanned aircraft system, there's a ground control station involved, there are communication links involved, there are the users of the data that are produced by that unmanned system. So from a ground perspective, let's just talk about that. The, the ground station that controls the unmanned aircraft is critical from multiple angles. And the innovations that are underway uh, as we speak are making sure that the ground control station can not only successfully and reliably, reliably control the aircraft, but it's also interoperable across a broad community, international community. There are standards that are in place uh, for international interoperability, such as NATO STANAG 4586. And lots of development is occurring to make sure that systems are compliant with that so allies can share data across the network. In addition, um, on the ground side, modularity is very key uh, to the design and development of any ground system. Today, everything is migrating toward open systems so that new applications can be hosted and plugged into a ground system without a reinvention of a purpose-built ground system specifically for a, a certain mission. Excellent. Okay. Um, I, I guess I was remiss I'm going to introduce the rest of our panelists. We also have Chris Day. He is the head of capability engineering at Shebel. Um, he leads the global capability development for unmanned systems at the company, um, which is a global provider of unmanned helicopter systems. And then we also are joined by Mr. Martin Rowe Wilcox, um, who works at BAE Systems. He's been there for over 37 years, with 12 years in an unmanned systems role. Currently, I'm an old guy as well. So Tyrannus I can, I can, aircraft. I can relate to what Frank was saying. Uh, so yeah, do you guys do you guys have a feeling on this emerging marketplace as well? Is is the innovation aircraft only, or are we talking more about ground control <laughs> systems, sensors, and the uh, like? It's it's a, an interesting subject and. Probably go back as far as Frank does. Actually, I think I passed cost many, many years ago. Um, the challenges that I see today, and the challenges that, that that we need to be all cognizant of, is that we have these amazing unmanned systems, air, ground, mm -hmm. and sea now, that are capable of collecting massive amount of data, massive amount of data. And, and as Frank said, you know, we can now do it all weather with with radars and we're doing that every day all around the world. Um, but not only that, we can collect it, collect the standard video, we can collect the SAR, we can collect information from across the whole of the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, I think what people tend to forget is just the amount of data that produces. Now I remember not many years ago um, starting to think, well, we can do this quite efficiently now, we can do it quite effectively. What I really failed to understand is that all that data leads 
in one direction, and that is terabytes of information. How do you manage, how do you control, how do you turn terabytes of information into intelligence that the vast majority of the community, that the community really starts to value? And I think that's one of the challenges that we all have to look at, that we can now produce this in extraordinary numbers. And the easy way is just to throw more and more manpower at it, which is, which is not really where we want to go. And, and so from my perspective, one of the key challenges that, that we've all got to look to address is how do we manage terabytes of information today and, and even larger amounts tomorrow? And we can produce that very, very quickly. So that's one particular area that, that certainly concerns me. The other area is, is that I'm so envious of Frank and his Predator because it's such a large system. Um, at Shebel, um, we pride ourselves on, a, uh, on our tactical systems, but the fact that we manage to condense so much into such a small product. So when people come along and say to me about, you know, we can integrate, sense and avoid a new radar or a new whatever, it's, it's incredibly challenging. And, and there's always this trade-off for us is how do you get reliability, maintainability into such a small product and make certain that it all works together. So I'd love a large platform. It would make my job a lot easier, but, but I'm certainly at the, the, the smaller end of the, of the world. And those three challenges, reliability, maintainability into a small product, it, it is, is immensely challenging. And it's something that, that, that we need to be very cognizant of as we move forward. I guess I, I can concur with a lot of what's been said already, obviously. Um, what the, the, the sort of area where BA systems have been looking for some time is, is then is really looking at the use of unmanned systems in the next generation of combat. Um, so for me, a lot of it is around um, the integration of a uh, combat system into the next, next sort of war space, if you will. Um, and that is not about replacing manned combat aeroplanes in the near term, it's about having manned and unmanned systems working close together. So very much the challenges that Frank was talking about, about integration of the, of the overall network, having, having a platform as a node, not as a, as a platform on its own. But also taking those systems into what I would class as more contested airspace, where, where the observability of the platform is going to become key. Uh, and that's where a lot of other areas where we've been, been doing our sort of technology demonstration with programs like the Trimest program and so on. Excellent. Martin, just to follow up to that, um, how do you see the levels of automation contributing to the effectiveness of the future combat air system? We've, um, we've looked at automation from, from a number of, of angles. The, fir the first thing is, as you go to a low observable airplane, it's hard to fly. It doesn't actually want to fly on its own. Um, and as we found with a lot of our early early aeroplanes, um, we wouldn't even share the video because it's not particularly pleasant. Um, it, the, the, you know, if you don't put a high level of automation on the platform itself, it, it really doesn't fly in a straight line. Straight line couldn't fly. So, so first thing is, you, you always think of automation in flight control. Um, it's as important to try and look at levels of automation in way in which you use the information. So coming to into Chris's challenge of terabytes of data, how can we use that on board the, of the platform, bringing capabilities like target detection, target recognition on board, so that actually you need to communicate off the platform less, reduce your bandwidth requirements, make that. Now, there are demonstrations of that in the lab, there are demonstrations on, in test vehicles, we're still quite away from maturing that technology to be able to deploy it. But certainly, if you were to give um, a system the, the, the job of planning out its own search area, looking for targets, and telling the guys on the ground, you asked me to look for a Toyota Land Cruiser, and I've just found you one here. Do you think it should be there? Then, then you're stepping that on now into the point where there's a, there's a high level of intelligence in the platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, building on that, um, I'll, I'll start with Bill. How do you see the future of unmanned and manned teaming occurring? Okay. Uh, manned and unmanned teaming is a real mission today. It's done, as Frank mentioned in his presentation, where he had one of the first aircraft that, that worked in a manned and unmanned teaming environment. Uh, our customer for the shadow, the U.S. Army, is big on manned and unmanned teaming. And uh, these platforms, such as the shadow, uh, do un manned and unmanned teaming with the Apache helicopter. So basically, um, the shadow or any unmanned aircraft system can serve as the eyes and ears forward extending the effectiveness and the mission range of the helicopter pilot, keeping them out of harm's way. One great example of that is 
if there's a mission to look at a threat or possibly engage a threat over a mountain range, the helicopter pilot can stay in a, at a safe altitude while he sends his unmanned aircraft vehicle forward, so the eyes and ears are forward, and he only pops up and uh, takes a look at his target set when necessary. Um, you know, after the, the target's already been identified, located, and he can then go engage. So I think that's one great uh, opportunity. I see manned unmanned team, you know, also evolving, um, not only from that one scenario, but looking at multiple uh, vehicle types that can be teamed together. For example, you could take an unmanned system and team it with a ship for, uh, for various missions and, uh, you know, that can, you, you can imagine around the world, counter piracy, uh, counter narcotics, uh, search and rescue, to extend, again, the eyes and ears of a, of a manned force. Um, in addition, there's discussion of teaming an unmanned aircraft and an unmanned surface vessel to extend and range uh, in lots of other areas, such as mine sweep sweeping operations. Right. So those are just a few examples. Chris, I'm sure you must have something to add with um, camcopters use in the Mediterranean right. with refugees, right. yeah. um, at least with, uh, uh, with ships and other aircraft. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, because um, we've recognized for, for several years now that, that unmanned helicopters, um, certainly in the foreseeable futures, won't be replacing the manned helicopters. On, on many, many ships, and I've had many Navy captains say to me, well, Chris, when your man helicopter can CASI back or, or take a medical emergency to a local hospital, then we'll definitely be able to remove the, the manned helicopter from the platform. So that's my goal for, for many years in the future, but today, uh, the challenge for us, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting challenge, and um, I'm hopefully joining a, an exercise in the coming years that will allow us to explore this even further, is how do we get the manned helicopter on board, the natural organic asset on board a, uh, an existing warship to work with all the strengths of, a, of an unmanned system? And, and that in itself is quite challenging because we can bring new things to that platform over the horizon. Uh, uh, over the horizon intelligence, which it doesn't have at the moment, we can give the captain uh, of the ship or the, 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 the systems on the ship more warning of the challenges that, that, are, that are currently out in its operating environment. But then the next stage, which is even more exciting, is then how do we start to get our platform to work with unmanned ships, unmanned subsurface vehicles, because that is the next generation. That's, that's what we need to drive towards. So eventually, um, we start to live up to this statement that's been around for a few years, that we actually become a system of systems. We are just one node that operates with the best capability that a particular commander needs for a particular type of activity. Um, and for us, that's, that's the exciting future. So kind of stepping back from that, talking about teaming, um, you know, Martin, do you, see a, do you see a day where there are no manned combat aircraft? Will there always be teaming? Will there always be a man in the loop there? I, I think I'll come back to what I said. I think in the, in the, as we see it in the future, you're looking at um, the teaming step, um, potentially the unmanned component going where you would prefer not to put a pilot in the cockpit, um, potentially with an unmanned wingman for a combat aeroplane. I think that's our, our sort of, when we use the phrase future combat air system, it's that combination of man and unman to do the job in the best way. Um, I think we're a little way away yet from completely unmanned combat. Right. And, and kind of going back to the maritime platforms, Bill, I know that Textron is a multi-domain company focus. Um, do you see the unmanned maritime platforms being a game changer for the unmanned aircraft? Or are those going to work together? I, I absolutely do see those working together. Uh, for complementary you know, success on various kinds of missions, the ones that are identified, counter piracy, counter narcotics, um, range extension. We're already doing some work uh, right now to ensure that our, inter our systems can interface and interoperate together. Uh, there's strong customer interest in, making sh in, in providing a capability for one of the advanced ships in the U.S. Navy um, to extend its, uh, its capability to do mine hunting and mine sweeping type of operations. So. I do see a bright future in that area. Um, one of the questions I prepared, I was wondering um, how you guys, what, what's the perfect acquisitions process for unmanned systems moving forward? How can we field technologies that are both mature and capable, but also timely? Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Uh, I think one of, one of the challenges 
definitely that that we all face and, and need to understand as we move forward is that certainly you, you know in Shebel's perspective we're unbelievably agile we produce stuff very quickly um, we have the capability now to to support a whole range of different customers but at the end of the day one of the biggest challenges certainly in the US and certainly in Europe is is working with the regulators and how do you make certain that they can react in a, in a, in a timely way to support us and that is the, what can be a drag unless we're very careful the the other the other question which which Frank mentioned and once again made me slightly envious is is that you know we have to provide technology today that allows us to integrate into all forms of airspace because that's the future it's not a few years ago we used to think about it as 10 years away but it's I think it could be quicker than that and and it's great if, if you've got a large enough platform that you can fit a secondary radar that allows you to have that detect and avoid or sense and avoid then then you're in a happy place for the smaller more tactical platforms we have to look for alternative options there and I think we have a role with regulators to look at that. But I think until we crack those, um, and until we can improve those, it's always going to be a challenge. One thing I'd like to, can I add to that? Absolutely. All right, one thing I'd like to add, um, we do have a, uh, we're using a business model with an, a customer that demands agility right now called a fee-for-service business model. So we're actually paid to, uh, for the mission hours that we conduct, rather than selling aircraft or selling systems, or even maintaining those systems. We're paid to provide an operational capability. That is just one example of, I think, of a unique contracting mechanism. Uh, and what that does, it allows the customer to rely on us for, for IRED development of new capabilities, adding new sensors, uh, new packages that we prove, and then the customer has a flexible, adaptive contract model to be able to take advantage of those developments without having to go through an official government procurement process that approves you know, every step of the way. Right. Martin, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'd, I'd build on that. I think, I think it was, we're still living in a space where the sort of technology advancement is moving at such a pace that a traditional acquisition model doesn't quite work anymore. Right. Um, and I think, you know, the guys who've, who've been deploying systems, maybe when they're not completely mature, you know, taking a little bit of a risk, mm -hmm. in, a, in, you know, in a safe way, are those that are actually now sort of at the front of the, the field. And I think that's the, um, it's almost a sort of take a step, learn from it, build on the, that learning, take another step, rather than a, a major development program, which has been historically the way in which sort of the defense industry has gone. And I think that's certainly, um, you know, a lot of our TDPs have been very short, sharp programs, sort of six, nine, 12 months to design, build, fly, learn, move to the next step. Right. Um, and I think that model, uh, doesn't naturally fit with a traditional uh, acquisition process. So I think that's the challenge, is to get the, to field quickly, learn from it, move right. from that space. Yeah, and I think we've seen, because the, the space is moving so quickly, the systems are, are experiencing such great growth in, in military that they've moved so quickly into civil and um, mm. commercial applications. And I was wondering um, if you see the, the military systems we currently have being equally capable in these other realms of use in commercial aircraft. Um, do you see them being able to exist alongside other existing aircraft safely in a commercial space? I think the, the, the move into the commercial space is, is interesting. We've, um, in the UK, we've had a program called Australia running for the past sort of seven years that's brought together all of industry and the regulators um, to look at the big challenge, the opening all airspace to regular use of unmanned systems, and very much along the sort of the picture that Frank was showing there, it's a congested piece of airspace up there. Um, and and that the sort of the basic framework is around, has developed now around two things. So transparency and, and, and equivalence, the two great words we use. Transparency means if you put an unmanned system into airspace, it has to look like there's a pilot in the cockpit to every other air user. Um, to, to actually fly openly, you, we can't have special rules for unmanned systems. We have to fit within the overall regime. Regardless that drives of, technology. Regardless of size? Regardless, yeah, okay. I think so. Um, the second, the equivalence thing is then the level of safety. Mm -hmm. um, so this, the system has to be designed, built, qualified, certified. 
in the same way as a manned system of the same physical size. And that's the tight sort of two frames. Now, are we there today? No. <laughs> We're just about to launch a further phase of the Australia program to help us along that journey. But certainly demonstration flights like the one we did in, in the UK two years ago where we flew from our base in Walton up to the north of Scotland um, in cooperation with air traffic, with cooperating and non-cooperating air traffic, with those having onboard sensing and avoid equipment looking for um, the sort of uh, systems out there, talking through traditionally to, to air traffic, um, shows the potential now we need to mature that so we can deploy that technology. Um, and e effectively, that then becomes an equivalent technology in a, in a military space as well. Great. Chris, what kind of progress do you see in integrating UAS um, into operating along all types of aircraft? We, we've, had a, uh, we've had success in, in, in that migration from, from the man to the, to, to the, uh, from the, from the military into the civil. Um, a lot of it is about the business model. Um, because there are opportunities uh, out there, and it is you know the big drivers are, and, 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 and the company as a whole it invests a huge amount into into exactly the same sort of issues that we, the, the others have discussed. And that is, at the end of the day, you know you have to push up reliability if you're going to go into a, into a new area. You're going to take on a new take on a new uh, business model. We've also seen in the last couple of years an evolution to the service provision model because the civil market tends to want to dictate. Um, uh, uh, intelligence or, or, or some sort of information gathering by the hour and that, that takes, a, takes a business, even an, an agile business like ours, a little bit of time to think through to understand and, and then to get it right and I'm happy to say we're doing that today but it is a different model, it takes a different mindset, it takes a different set of challenges or puts a different set of challenges in the company. Um, and then once you've got those right, you can start to take on, as we have done on a couple of occasions, take on the manned aircraft world. But there are, once again, uh, a few steps that, that we can't do on our own. We are looking to, to other agencies to support us with. But there is no doubt that day has come and it's up to us as an organisation and as a, as a, as a group of, of companies to, to stand by and push it forward. Bill, do you have a un unique US perspective? since? by some accounts we're a little bit behind. <laughs> well, it, yeah, so it is interesting. Um, I would say we're a little bit behind perhaps in some areas, uh, right. and that would be uh, a lot rather than expand on this. But, Neither but, would I. No, right. <laughs> but uh, I do think uh, our, you know, my compatriots bring up a very good point, and um, you know, we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us in terms of uh, operating in the, in the manned airspace. Okay. Um, one of the things that was brought up is, and I think this is a key point, the capabilities that we need to have for safe operation in the in the uh, under you know FAA or, or other national rules would be to operate with the uh, the equivalent safety and regulations of an equivalent size aircraft that's manned. There is not one uh, one size fits all answer. Uh, I will also um, back up what what my partner said there on um, some of the hard lessons learned on these unique business models. Um, as I mentioned, fee-for-service, and, and you mentioned that as well, uh, it took us almost two years of, of operating on a contract to really apply the lessons that were learned and make it a successful business venture. So it is, uh, it is a unique model and not easy. Um, let's talk a bit about the technologies we're going to need um, to, to further the capabilities of unmanned systems in general, military and whatnot. Um, Martin, what kind of gaps do you see? Um, what, do you, what kind of technology do we need between where we are now and where we want to be? Um, two threads we've talked about already. Um, I think the, um, the sort of the, uh, the airspace challenge brings with it this detect and avoid challenge. Um, and many people looking at different routes, whether they be EO based, or whether they be radar based. Um, Effectively, you're looking at it from a, from a pilot's position. Um, you have to find a way of replacing the pilot's eyes in the aeroplane at the points of, a, of an operation when you require visual flying. And the pilot in that, in, in that environment avoids other air traffic and avoids weather and finds emergency landing locations. Effectively, those are the three key components. Um, maturing those technologies to the point where we're comfortable to certify them, to regulate them, to put them into commercial operation um, is still you know, a significant challenge. Mm -hmm. 
technologically we've demonstrated the concepts. It's not just about the senses, it's about what you do with the information when you've received. So you can detect something, what's, what's the step you then take to make a decision on that detection? Are you truly on a collision course? If you are, what's the standard approach of avoiding that, the TCAS equivalent? Um, how would you handle that in a general aviation space, which is where you're really flying sort of in, in that VFR space? So I think that's one of the key areas. Say so today we're demonstrating the concepts, maturing those, and putting them in a box that's on the shelf that you can sell thousands of, is you know is the maturing piece. Right, Bill and Chris. I, I've got three, uh, three key points <laughs> that are that are definitely. Um, areas that we need to look at. The first one, there is no doubt. Uh, two real panaceas that, that I've tried to dr drive forward in, in over many years. The first is that we have to move away from individual sensors. Individual sensors are horrendously expensive, sometimes far more than the platform or the rest of the system together. And, and we are talking about today about you know, electro-optics, we're talking about radars, we're talking about comments, we're talking about um, uh, comms relays. And at some point, there has to be a way in industry of pulling those together into a, into a more acceptable package. We waste so much space on a platform that are rapidly becoming antenna farms, and, and they're becoming more and more difficult to find places for antennas. So the fusion of sensors into a single package is going to help us, help us move forward. And with that it is my second point, and that is we have to move away from having people sat there just watching imagery or watching SAR or, or doing something with it. We have to have more automated systems that takes data and or automatically turns it into information that people can use. It, it just seems crazy to have teams of people sat on the ground just reviewing data. So that's an area that once we start to get more and more smarter sensors, much smarter sensors, we have to back that up with the ability to be able to, to exploit that data and disseminate it to the people that really need it. And my third one is slightly more controversial and, and it's born of experience that, that we as a company have gained from operating all over the world and that is we have to look at the vulnerabilities of GPS because GPS is starting to become a, a significant vulnerability that a lot of us in this community rely on. And there's some technology coming along that allows us to address some of those challenges, but it's a fundamental weakness that we will not be able to live with for, for too many years. So just to expand a little bit, I'd like to uh, harp on a point that, that was made about system interoperability and what do you do with all that data when you, when you receive it. And I think uh, Chris made an excellent point about when we have multi-sensors on, on a single aircraft or multiple sensor types on multiple aircraft and all of that information is fed to a system on the ground, how does the user deal with that data? What kind of processing is done? Behind that stands a key point which is uh, the generation and proliferation of standards that that data is based on. Because any time uh, information needs to be shared across systems or sent to a particular cell or operating unit where uh, somebody can perform a mission, it will not succeed if every time a new sensor is added to an aircraft, you have to reinvent the system to be able to receive and utilize that data. So standards for interoperability and data sharing across a network, I think, are key to the success of, uh, of these systems and bringing new capabilities in. Great. Um, kind of going back to speaking more about military systems, Bill, how do you think that geopolitical climate right now is going to impact how unmanned systems requirements are built in militaries around the world? Yeah, I think that um, you know all of you that are in this room uh, know uh, better than I do that the geopolitical climate is, is incredibly tough right now. There's all kinds of unrest across the world, um, you know, various terrorist groups, all types of things going on that are very difficult to deal with. It's a lot different than a, uh, what we think of as a, uh, a standard or conventional military threat. So uh, I think one of the key things that, that needs to be done is we need quickness in, a, in the acquisition process um, to be able to rapidly add new capabilities, not only to aircraft, but the systems that utilize those, uh, those sensors, for example. Um, we also need uh, rapid response capability and modularity so that when new threats are identified and, and new missions have to occur, it doesn't take months or years to put a new capability on a system. We can move more quickly. Uh, again, back to standards. If, if modularity standards are identified so that 
sensor A, B, C, or D can be added to an aircraft relatively quickly, uh, I think the whole community will be more able to address new threats. Great. Do either of you have thoughts on, on different needs in different parts of the world and, and how that was going to play out? Uh, I think. I think from our perspective, um, and we have a worldwide customer base, so we're very sensitive to, to many of the geopolitical challenges. Is for us, it's, it's making certain, and it's a, I suppose it's almost a, a pseudo title for myself, it's future-proofing the system. How do we make, you know, how do we pull together a combination of technologies to make certain that we can easily insert our capability into whatever the, the current challenge is? Because there's no doubt about it. Yesterday's technology is is not going to is not going to cut the mustard with where we need to be in the future, uh, and I've literally in the last in the last sort of five or six years we've seen the evolution from unmanned aircraft with just a single sensor to, for instance, now at Shebel we can regularly fly around with three or four different sensors, and it's gathering all that different intelligence that allows us to create a different product for a different customer base with a different challenge uh, in different parts of the world. I think I'll probably take it just slightly further into the future and, and just sort of look at the trend now is around potentially wanting to put systems into a more contested space. Mm. Um, and so, you know, a challenge for us is going to be around the survivability of the flying part of the platform. Um, that's around the observability of that in, in, in all spectrums, in, in a radio, radar, EO, um, and uh, IR and, and, and also comms as well, you know, the communication signature of these platforms is, is quite high. So I think the challenge for us is, is around how can we now start maturing technologies that, that put us into that sort of contested space. Um, what sort of lessons learned do you all have from operating your different systems around the world that you're going to bring forward? Yeah, one thing I'd like to emphasize, and it was, it was talked about multiple times, uh, System reliability is huge, right? We've got to design these systems with the reliability it takes not only to be safe, but to be maintainable for future missions. Um, if one had to deploy with multiple aircraft in a, in, a, uh, in a formation, a military formation, or for commercial purposes, and you have to bring truckloads and truckloads worth of spares and equipment to keep those systems operable, it's not a good, it's not a good answer. Uh, also from the safety perspective, which I think Frank covered very well, um, certainly we need to have uh, uh, reliability that's on par with, uh, with manned aircraft, both for safety and just general maintenance purposes. Right. Yeah, I think I, I've, I've been lucky to deploy systems all over the world in various guises and, and, and I have a, a relatively simple rule of thumb that when somebody comes along and says, you know, the system's two or three years old. It's, from my perspective, it's maturity. So two or three years, is you, you've not really achieved a great deal. And I think Frank alluded to it in his presentation. I cannot, I cannot emphasize the value to be had of maturity, of operating around the world, because every single environment throws a different stress on the system or a different part of the system. You start to see different failure rates. And, and you know we've gone through that growth. We understand that the pain associated with that, and you just cannot achieve that level of maturity and that level of reliability in, in just a couple of years. It takes time. And so, from my perspective, um, maturity, operating it around the world in a whole different range of operational theatres, in a different range of, of climatic conditions, is what really stresses a system and really starts to show its its value and its worth. Mm. And yet, actually getting to that level of maturity in the first place is always the challenge. Yeah. Um, so if, if I go back sort of right to the beginning of some of our work, 10 years ago we, we wanted to fly um, a UAV in the UK in civil airspace as a civil operation um, up in Scotland. And uh, it took us five months to actually construct the system, to put it on the table with the regulators. It took us nine months to convince the regulator to let us fly for nine minutes. Um, and, and, the, and it was down to lack of maturity in the system, not surprisingly, you know, what was the pedigree of all the components, how do we build that up into a total system, um, and so, but we, you know, we sat down with, with all the, the, the players and so on, and, and you then realise that actually you end up with this position where without a regulatory framework you can't design a system, and without a system you can't design a regulatory framework, and actually that, that sort of nine minute flight was what convinced us we needed to work in a far more collaborative way 
and, and from that the Australia program was born. But yes, it, it, if I go back to sort of literally things we had to do in that in that operation um, to avoid flying over uh, over sort of populated areas, we literally had to ask a local golf course not to have anybody on the course during the day. Uh, we had to have policemen on the beach to stop people taking their dogs walking um, because we had to fly over a completely sterile space. Thankfully, we've moved on from there. Um, but you know that's uh, you know an example of where you know system maturity is absolutely key. You're right. Excellent. I'm not certain how we're doing on time. If someone in the back can let me know, five minutes. Um, is there are there any other topics we haven't touched on that you guys think are important to discuss in this in this sphere? I think it's something that I can't control. And it's something that certainly concerns us. And that is, and, and so it's almost a point to throw over to, to the community here today. And that is that we, we as an industry can produce some amazing technology, and we do. And, and we can now integrate an, array, an amazing array of sensors. And, and, and we can produce products that that are incredibly valuable, but more specifically, the real value of a UAV is it can be timely. We can deliver something that, that needs to be understood and appreciated very, very quickly. The next challenge, and the one that we struggle to address most of all, is that at the end of the day, those techniques and capabilities have to be migrated into your infrastructures. They have to work with your people. They have to work with, with your organisations. They have to work with whatever uh, C4I infrastructures you have. And unless we as a community can work more closely across the world with those type of communities, getting that product in a timely way to those information uh, decision makers, it's not just reliant on ourselves. It's making certain that, that all that infrastructure is. It's a point about standards allows us to make that, that, that transition happen very quickly. Because to say the technology is a lot of the technology is out there today, but some of the challenges that we're faced with in, in the coming years is how do we make that technology interface very, very quickly but very, very effectively into all those systems that you already have or you intend to procure in the coming years. And that's particularly challenging for us when we might be operating on a ship, for instance, that at the end of the day that, that UAV has to be a completely organic part of the ship. And, the man, and linked to the manned helicopter. So that we can move in certain directions and we have certain levels of flexibility. But unless we as a community understand some of your thinking about where you want to go and some of the things that you want to achieve, then there's always going to be a disconnect there that will always be difficult for us to assess. And as you rightly say, in terms of research and, or investment bucks, you know, it, it, it's a risk that sometimes it, it can be very, very, very concerning. So I think. I think the next steps not only involve just industry producing the technology and the sensor guys producing more capable sensors, it's how do we work better with you as a community to make certain that we take those next steps together and, and integration with, because we are only a hook for a very capable sensor in the sky, how do we get that sensor data into the systems that you actually need it, um, as quickly and as efficiently as possible and, uh, and that's a big challenge for us. I'd like to, uh, one thing I'd just like to add is um, what we haven't talked about a lot here is training. While we talked about multi-mission capability and interoperability and standards, we haven't talked a lot about training. And uh, that aspect of these systems is just as important for military operations as they are commercial. One of the major investments that we had to make as a company um, was for our Arison system. We've got, uh, we've got an international oil and gas company that we're flying missions for today that we had to establish a, uh, a training regimen not only for the pilots but the data analysts um, that we're running at a site that we we stood up and we fund so the training behind these systems to ensure not only safety but mission effectiveness i think is key so anything that can be done to um, to make the systems more user intuitive and uh, more reliable again harping on that issue uh, is key but we've got to we've got to be able to train them and I'd Martin. echo the training point and, and also sort of build on that and, and sort of say that the, the difference of a training regime with an unmanned system is the fact you don't actually physically need to fly the aeroplane. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you're confident enough in it, you know, if you can give the right uh, synthetic feel to your training, 
and that's what drives the cost down because the you know what we haven't talked at all about is the cost of ownership of, the, of, of, a, of a system. If this uh, you know early generation systems have more men in than the man systems a lot of the time, so the, the future space is going to be about getting that cost of ownership this debate and half of that is the cost of training and currency uh, uh, of the crews and so on. So I think that is a very key point. Yeah. Excellent. Well, there's been so much change in the last five or six years that I've been covering this and I'm sure the next five or six will be even more exciting than that. So thank you very much to all of you for participating and all of you for listening.